I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the last chapter of the book of Jonah. Jonah is a tiny little book, and you know I could tell you to find it between Obadiah and Micah, but I don't think that will help much. So let us tell you to move to the Old Testament, or as one of my professors used to call it, the less recent testament. He didn't like the word old, and I don't like it either the older I get. So go to the less recent testament in the book of Jonah, and we will read the fourth chapter. I would like to, if I may, with your permission, just punctuate it with a few comments in the middle of it, and then have a brief word of prayer with you, and enter into my message entitled, A Fish Out of Water, or possibly the prophet who should have missed the boat. But this is a very, very strange and fascinating book, and we must understand it, <coughs> and I'll do my best to help unravel it a little bit. Jonah chapter 4. The first verse of that chapter says this, But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. It is important to know what has stirred up this anger. A revival has broke out amongst the people. He wanted to go there and say, 40 days and you're going to be destroyed. Hallelujah. He was not planning on an invitation that would bring the whole people, including the leader, and as it happened, uh, the average evangelist would have wanted to wait to get home so he could send a prayer letter to all of his supporters and say, do you know what happened when I was in Nineveh? But this fellow wanted the reverse to happen. Let's see if we can understand why. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That's why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. In other words, he's complaining that God's too gracious. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Not the first time in the book he wants to die, not the last time in the book he wants to die. But the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? Jonah doesn't answer, so God's going to come back to it again. Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. The only time in the book he's happy. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Here he goes again. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. I want to pause here for just a moment and to this. If you were reading that in the Hebrew, please believe me, you would s sit up a little tighter and take note. It almost has the force of an expletive from Jonah. If you'd give me permission, it's almost like him saying something like, yes, I'm, I'm damned angry. I'm angry enough to die, to perish. The passion that is coming from the mouth of this man to the living God, we have got to try our best to understand. That's the intensity. The Lord said, you have been concerned enough about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? It is interesting that this book ends with a question, and I think it leaves the reader the discernment to understand what Jonah ought to have answered. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word which does not hide the scars of its heroes, that it tells it like it really is, etched for centuries that it might be etched into our own consciences. Lord, we look at our world right now wounded as a civilization in the closing moments of this, the bloodiest of all centuries. As we look at the bloodletting in parts of Europe, as the sadness in parts of Africa, tragedies man against man in Asia, and here in our own nation where thousands are murdered in their homes or on the streets. We look at people too, such as these that Jonah was looking at. Will you not tell us something today of what our responsibility is 
Take your servant's words and let them be yours, Lord, to our hearts. Evoke a response that will be glorifying to you. Anoint your servant to that end. In Christ's name, amen. Let me begin with a story that is very blunt, but I borrow the words from the story writer himself, so please take it in that spirit because it, it could be so easily misinterpreted with all of the sensitivities with which we live in cross-cultural uh, situations today. But many years ago, Simon Wiesenthal wrote one of the most moving books you'd ever want to read about the trauma of what happened as in the, on the tales of the Holocaust there. He penned that word, those words many, many years ago, and the book is called The Sunflower. And in that, he basically says this, how as a young man he saw the Nazis come into his home and drag his mother away and just shove her in with hundreds of other Jewish women into a freight car and only to have her life taken at the hands of these murderers. How he saw his own grandmother murdered in the stairway of her home. How he saw 89 of his immediate relatives tortured and ultimately killed in the hands of this murderous regime. But then he tells this rather electrifying story. He himself was taken into a concentration camp and his duties involved taking care of the hospital premises. When a nurse came to him and said, excuse me, sir, are you a Jew? And he said, yes. She said, I have somebody who wants to see you. And she ushered him to a hospital room that had all the intimations of sickness and death. And there was a man lying there bandaged from head to toe, except for an opening for his nostrils, for his mouth, and for his ears, so he could breathe, so he could speak, and so he could listen. Bandaged up was the rest of his body and in pain. And he asked Mr. Wiesenthal to identify himself. He really was of Jewish stock. He said, yes, sir, I am. He said, I want to say something to you. I have just a few minutes to live. I'm dying. He said, I'm dying a very painful death physically, but even more is my death emotionally. The guilt within me, within me is tearing me apart. I have been responsible for killing hundreds of your people. And then he narrated the most recent episode, which was very blood-curdling and chilling to the bones of Simon Wiesenthal. He said, before I die, sir, I want you to do me just one favor. I am truly sorry. I am torn apart by guilt. I beg you, would you please find it in your heart, in whatever way you can, to forgive me. I don't want to die with this guilt in my hands. I want somebody from that nation to say to me that he personally forgives me. Wiesenthal several times says he tried to turn to walk away, but the man just beckoned and pleaded and begged. He said, I want to hear you telling me you forgive me. I beg you. Simon Wiesenthal says in his book that he thought about it for 30 to 45 seconds, could not bring it in his heart to pronounce the words, I forgive you, thinking of all of the atrocities, turned away and left the man in his room silent as Wiesenthal pulled the door shut. After many years, he himself began to think about whether he had done right or whether he had done wrong, whether he even had the prerogative to pronounce the man forgiven. He wrote to 32 important personages around the world, some of them Nobel laureates, some of them experts in theological thinking, psychological thinking, dealing with all of the arena of guilt. And out of them, only uh, over 26, 26 of them wrote and told him that they thought he'd done the right thing. Only six thought it was very questionable whether he ought to have walked away without in some way trying to bring some forgiveness to this man. Fascinating story. I cannot pretend to stand here and tell you whether it was easy or difficult for this man to have pronounced forgiveness. I cannot even stand here and tell you whether he had the prerogative in his person to do something as massive as that on behalf of his nation. I am only telling you that story to put it in historical context. We must understand that this is not some reluctant prophet who wants to be on the run. This is a prophet whose passions run deep on behalf of his people. This is a prophet where the memory is not faltering for him. This is a prophet who lived in the part of the world where history never dies. 
If you were to take a manual today and see what's happening in Bosnia, if you were to go to one group of people and ask them in the name of reason, what are you doing killing tens and thousands of this group of people in your own nation? One of them will stand and look you in the eye and say, have you read your history from 40 years ago of what they did to hundreds of thousands of my people and what happened six centuries ago where both of us were victimized by a third? I am not in any way trying to absolve the situation. I'm only trying to tell you how deeply you can react in moments of history locked into such intense antipathy and hate. William Barclay, the scholar of the New Testament, says, when you go to the matrix of civilization at that time, which Jonah refers to, peoples there were the most hating and the most hated people in that particular context. That's what's happening here. He does not want to go to Nineveh because the Ninevites had been ruthless with his people. Thousands of his own people had been murdered by them. In fact, in extra biblical uh, literature, you will see pictures of skulls arranged in a pyramid. When the Ninevites came and stormed a nation, they would take the intelligentsia, decapitate them, and build some kind of a pyramid of skulls to say, we've been here too. That's the kind of trauma that is going on. But as Jonah is commanded to go, he is told to go five to seven hundred miles in the northeasterly direction. He doesn't want to do it. He goes down to Joppa, buys himself a ticket, and he's moving 2,000 miles in the westerly direction as he catches himself a boat and moves on to Tarshish. Interestingly enough, 800 years later, in the same setting in Joppa, Peter is having to deal with the similar command to take the gospel to Cornelius. Remember that story? And Peter says, this is an unclean mission you're you're sending me on. And God says, don't call that clean which I have, uh, don't call that unclean which I have called clean. A few chapters later in the New Testament, you notice Paul talking to the people who wanted to lynch him. And Paul goes to a Roman centurion and says, would you please guard me as I tell these people why my mission is taking me where it is. And the people listen back. They sit down. They're listening to his talk on his conversion and all of the drama of it. They are in pin drop silence. And then the Bible says, until he said that one word when they wanted to take his life for it, what is that one word? That word is when Paul says, God has commissioned me as a missionary to the Gentiles. As soon as the word Gentile was used, it sort of lit a fuse, and they were ready to say, away with him. They wanted his life. That's what's happening here. Jonah is this reluctant man in the boat, And as he is moving in that opposite direction, he goes down into the lower part of the boat and he puts his head down on a pillow and he's sound asleep. Instead of going 500 miles in the northeasterly direction, he's heading 2,000 miles in the westerly direction. Can I say something to you? When you know something to be right and you're not living by that, you will never stand still. You have to move in the opposite direction. And as Jonah was sound asleep, trying to run from this reality. The captain of the boat comes and wakes him up, and you know the story. Jonah says, look, fellas, it's me. If it weren't for me, this all this would not have happened. So he says to them, why don't you take me and throw me overboard? The storm will be still. You know, I've often was wondered about that suggestion from Jonah. If he really were as genuine as he was trying to be or appeared to be, why did he want them to throw him overboard? Why didn't he say, I'll do you a favor, and I'll jump off overboard myself? but he cannot live up to the responsibility to what he knows to be true. Bertrand Russell, the great English philosopher, was once asked, when you stand before God and find out that he really exists, what are you going to say to him as a disclaimer of of why you rejected him there? And he says, well, I will just look God in the eye and say to him, you did not give me enough evidence. Very interesting. When the book of Romans tells us man's problem is not the absence of evidence, it is the suppression of it. And here is Jonah suppressing that evidence, moving 2,000 miles in the westerly direction. And what is really happening is that intriguing contest between God and Jonah trying to get his attention. And I see three problems in the mind of Jonah. Number one, he was out of touch with his surroundings. Out of touch with his surroundings. 
three times in these 48 verses, 1,328 words, which the scholars refer to as a minor prophet. Three times in this tiny little book, God gives him a threefold imperative, arise, go, and cry. Arise, go, and cry. That arise literally means wake up. Get up, Jonah. He seems to love the horizontal position, and God is forever waking him up. Get up, Jonah, get up. Go and cry. He may be a minor prophet in the minds of the theologians in terms of volume. He is not minor in terms of intensity. Jesus himself refers to him, and if he were indeed a minor prophet, he's the only minor prophet Jesus referred to in his own earthly ministry. Arise, go, and cry. Out of touch with the storm that is raging outside. Let me try and point something out to you. Jonah made some fundamental mistakes here, and I hope you and I can glean the lesson very, very importantly. I don't know how many of you like flying, but I hate it, and half of my life is spent 35,000 feet in the air. I am convinced that God allowed planes to be invented because more people talk to him at that level than any number talk to him (laughs) at ground level. I have seen more lips and more symbols of the cross up there outside of the baseball diamond, I think, before they start hitting. But I remember once flying from Toronto to Chicago, and the pilot told us very euphemistically that they had technical difficulties, which is very helpful when you're a non-technical person, and tells you that we cannot land because he cannot lower the landing gear. Uh, Very nice to know that. And as he was informing us of that, we were told we were going to have to make an emergency landing, dumping all our excess fuel uh, before we could come into this situation and uh, try and force a landing gear, whatever he was going to do. We were all redistributed and repositioned for what it was worth. We were all given the brace position, what to do when we were landing, which is to put your head between your knees, hold on to your ankles, and breathe normally. Do you know something I noticed happening outside, inside that plane? Of course, outside there are police cars and ambulances and the lights are flashing and you're settling all your last rites with God, as it were. Have you ever wondered why they call these places terminals? (laughs) That's, That's always been one of the most intriguing things to me. They call them, and then the pilot tells you we're in our final approach, as if you're not convinced yet. But as I looked around the inside of the aircraft, do you realize there was not one person asleep? (laughs) Not one man, woman, or child asleep. And if the eyes were closed, the lips were moving. (laughs) You see, you can't go to sleep when there's such a ravaging risk around you and a storm, as it were, gathering around that aircraft. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a storm around our world right now, all over, including our streets right here, and some of us are tending to be sound asleep, out of touch with what is really going on in that cloistered existence where the door can be shut and we look upon ourselves and feel how nice it is to be in this protected setting. Let me describe for you. One writer, George Will, who writes a Newsweek magazine periodically, describing the situation right here in the American scene in an article entitled Decadence and the Times. Times Square, rotting core of the Big Apple, is home of this city's last growth industry, pornography. This industry has flourished in spite of a naive hope, and it represents the failure of a public policy, which, like so many liberal policies, was based on nothing more than naive hope. Some aspects of our American life have become so vulgar that they can hardly be discussed without contributing to the coarsening of our lives. Elbow your way through the dirty men in dirty raincoats and crowded peep shows and read for yourself the vivid descriptions of current fare. These are no longer just CD storefront operations. On 8th Avenue, there's a pornography supermarket, a piggly wiggly for perverts. It is located in a modern building owned and shared by a major bank. Pornography in this area has achieved new sliminess involving children and animals, and business is booming. I shall not continue, except with a parenthetical reminder to you 
that Dr. James Dobson said that three most painful years of his mature Christian life were spent when he was on the presidential commission looking into this horrific trade where men, women, and children are being exploited. He talked about how a little boy had been stabbed by a blade and how one pornographer thought it was enough to take a picture so that he could titillate the imaginations of some of those indulgent men who were going to buy his magazine. And Dobson reminds us of the image he had in his mind of a huge piece of mechanism standing beside a building, just knocking that building down into bits and pieces. And he said, as I walked through the room once to get away from the intensity of what I was being exposed to and the horror of it, he said, I thought to myself, dear Lord, is this what these people are doing to our nation and to our children? It's real. The storm is out there as a whole generation is being sacrificed. But listen to what he continues in the movie industry harnessing this. Until the final minutes, this Latin American film called Snuff is a mishmash of shootings and knifings and general mayhem. This part is not much worse than what erupts on U.S. television at 9.01 each night after the family hour. But the final minutes of Snuff show a man dismembering and disemboweling a live woman using a knife, wire clippers, and an electric saw. The only groups to complain were the feminist groups that missed the larger point and denounced snuff as an insult to women. The final murder, whether real or fake, is repulsive enough to convince the dismal viewers who want to believe it is real. When I saw it, the final butchery left the viewers tittering merrily, asking one another, it was real, wasn't it? The audience would have been surly if the murder had been unconvincing. Remember a decade ago, the Connecticut woman who went to see I Am Curious Yellow? That Swedish film was a great shocker in the 60s, even though it only showed simulated sexual intercourse. That wasn't enough for the Connecticut woman who indignantly walked out and said, I paid for filth and I didn't get filth. How do you react to that? Particularly... For those of you who, who work with children, who see your own children or your grandchildren or some child that you love growing up in this kind of a menu being offered to them day after day, night after night, all in the name of doing whatever they feel is right, nobody answering the question, what is it right to feel? Half of my ministry is spent on university campuses, tough, hard-nosed agonizing settings. Just a few days from now, I will be on the Ohio State campus for four days, which is the largest university in this country. And you, I know the hard-headed professors that you're going to have to do battle with. I know the questions that will come storming immediately after you've finished asking for some moral and spiritual absolutes in our time. And all of these men stand, women standing behind professory lecterns, at least many of them, somehow in academic verbiage, hiding, drowning out the real anguish of this nation and the real hunger that the world is craving for within themselves. And the reaction you have is, I, at least I can speak for myself, the reaction I have is, why do you want me to go to such an immoral, unconscionable group of people? Can't somebody else do that? A week ago, sitting in a Midwest, Middle, Middle Eastern country that I shall leave unnamed, sitting at a head table surrounded by people of a completely different worldview, a strong fundamentalist religious movement, flanked on every direction on their side and about to stand up and give my own testimony called the journey of a skeptic. I can't tell you how your heart beats harder and harder and you want to say, God, I wish there were somebody else you could put into this place, put me in the confines of a setting like a church where they all will agree with me. That's what's going on with Jonah. And Jonah made that simple but catastrophic mistake. I want you to hear this now. Jonah branded the people of Nineveh as immoral, failing to recognize that immorality is always preceded by impiety. People are immoral because they are first impious and not the other way around. Immorality in our streets is because there is irreverence in our hearts before God. Which means if the morality is merely symptomatic, then how can we solve it symptomatically by just changing our laws? We have got to change the heart of the individual and only God is big enough to do that. 
And I say to you, that's my quandary, that's yours, and that was Jonah's nearly 3,000 years ago. Let me tell you the most fast, one of the most fascinating stories of one of America's earliest, in fact, America's first missionary to go overseas. His name was Adoniram Judson. Judson was a brilliant, brilliant young man. In fact, before he had reached his teens, if my memory serves me right, he was teaching the adult Sunday school class, the book of Revelation, from the original language. He was just a genius. So all eyes were on him. But he had a roommate, a fellow by the name of Jacob Ames. And Jacob Ames and he, for some reason, decided to become antagonistic towards things Christian, and they exchanged ideas with those who were trying to defend the faith and sent terror through the campus of those who were pro-biblical teaching while A. Ames and, uh, Ames and uh, Judson were trying to undercut all of that. The day came where they graduated, and as I said, everybody looking towards Judson, wondering what he would do with his brilliant mind. He was going to go into the world of theater, rode to New York City from his home in Malden, Massachusetts, interviewed for theater, and he was riding back. As he was riding back, fatigued by this long journey, he decided to stop at an inn. But the innkeeper said there was no room there. He would have to ride on for a little longer. He said, sir, why don't you give me the front hall? I'll pay you the price of a room. I'm so tired. The manager said, I can't do that. He said, but I'll tell you what, Mr. Judson, I can do for you. There is a room, but adjacent to that room is a man very critically ill. He's dying of a disease where he's crying in fits of profanity and a stench is coming out of his body. I don't even know if you can withstand it. He said, sir, give me that next room. Nobody's going to keep me awake. And he tried to get to sleep but couldn't. Listening to this man in fits of raving, profanity, crying out, Judson tried to cover his ears and so on to block it out, didn't succeed, till the noise itself subsided and Judson went to sleep. Later on in the morning, he was paying his bill. And he says, what happened? He began to get quiet in the early hours of the morning. Did he feel better? The manager says, no, sir, the man died on our hands. Adoniram Judson looked at the man and said, what do you do? A stranger comes into your inn, you don't know who he is, and you're suddenly faced with this situation. Well, how do you proceed? He said, Mr. Judson, it poses a problem, but let me tell you something. What I cannot put together is the background of this man and the manner of death he died. He obviously was a brilliant young man, Mr. Judson. You, you went to, and uh, Judson himself had gone to Rhode Island College in Providence, and he says, this man dying next door, was a graduate, honors graduate of Rhode Island College in Providence. His name was Jacob Ames. Suddenly, Judson said, what did you say his name was? He said, his name was Jacob Ames, a graduate of Rhode Island College in Providence, today Brown University. Judson did not realize for a moment or two how hard that blow was going to be when he recognized the man who died next door to him had been his roommate at college for all those years, crying out in agony now in the closing moments of his life. Judson says this in his biography, I got onto the horse and tried to ride back to my home, but I couldn't because as the hooves of the horse were pounding into the ground, there were two words pounding into my heart, death, hell, death, hell, death, hell. Judson dismounted and began his own journey in his serious commitment to Christ He went to India as a missionary. He was kicked out of India, went to Burma. He lost his wife to a disease she contracted there, a sheer loneliness. He remarried, lost his second wife too, lost some of his children and most of his missionary colleagues, desperately wanting to do the translation work of the Bible into Burmese before he passed away. He married for the third time. And now as the Burmese authorities incarcerated him, he was in prison. And as he tells the story of the moving moment where his wife, who had given birth to their child while he was in prison, clutching this infant in one arm, crawled on hands and knees to get to his cell so that Judson, through the bars, could put his hand out and stroke the face of his own little one. The Burmese authorities realized that he was not going to live for too much longer. All the while completing, of course, his translation of the Bible into Burmese while his wife completed the translation of the Bible into Thai. Finally, they put him into a boat to send him back to the United States. He never made it back, died en route. Outside of his home in Malden, Massachusetts, these words are etched in stone. Reverend Adoniram Judson, born August 19, 1788, died April 12, 1850. Malden, his birthplace, the ocean, his sepulcher, converted Burmans in the Burmese Bible, his monument, his record is on high. By the way, Don Richardson, in his book, Eternity in Their Hearts, 
picks up a little bit on this when he talks about a Burmese folklore, how they have only found out in recent times that the truth of God was going to come someday in a book brought to us by a white man from somewhere. Marvelous story of how brilliantly God shaped the life of this man and took the gospel message into Burma so that the Indian people and the Burmese people had the word. And today when the Burmese cracks open the Bible, he sees the legacy of Judson's work. When the Thai people opened their Bible, it was Adoniram Judson's wife who translated it. It all began, listen, when he looked beyond the immorality into the spiritual root for that problem rather than the other way around. There was a noted criminal by the name of Charlie Peace in England who was being taken to the gallows and a minister was reading the word of God to him. And as the man turned around, Charlie Peace looked at the minister and said, what are you reading about? He said, I'm reading about hell. And Charlie Peace said, minister, do you really believe that? He said, reverend, do you really believe that? He said, let me tell you something. If I believed even half of what you claim to believe about this, I would crawl across England on my hands and knees and count it worth my while, even if it were to be littered with glass pieces, to save one soul from that destiny that you so glibly talk about. Think of that for a sermon to a minister reading to a man heading to the gallows. If I believed even half of what you believe about these things, I would crawl across England on my hands and knees, even if it were to be littered with glass pieces, and count it worth my while to save one soul from that hell that you so glibly talk about. If you and I believe in the spiritual lostness of mankind, then the pressure that Jonah felt and struggled with is the pressure we feel and struggle with. But we must recognize it is a spiritual lostness, not merely a moral depravity. There was a second struggle in Jonah's life. Not only was he out of touch with his surroundings, he was also out of touch with his message. He'd been so close to the proclamation of the word, never bothered to get to the heart of his message and its implications for the world, for the world over. He saw himself on the inside of a fish, enjoying the fact that he knew God was listening to him. You're a God of mercy. You're a God of kindness but failing to realize the implications of what that had for the message of those all over the globe and began to look at it only in provincial terms. You see, the point is this. It is possible for you and me to be in touch with the verbiage of the message without recognizing its implications for our own lives and for the lives of the peoples of this world. I think of the great story in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 5, where a man called Gehazi is very close to the prophet Elisha. Elisha is the one who looked to God one day and said, I want a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Elijah had performed eight miracles. Elisha wanted a double portion. He was going to perform 16. And Gehazi was standing in one of the greatest of all the miracles that Elisha performed. A man by the name of Naaman, a Syrian leper who was a general, came to, came to Elisha and wanted to be healed of his leprosy. And Elisha said to him, you go to the river Jordan and dip in that river Jordan seven times. Naaman was very upset at this rather ridiculous requisition, go to the river Jordan and dip in the river Jordan seven times. But his soldiers said to him, Mr. General, if it is going to rid you of your leprosy, why don't you listen to Elisha and go and do it? So he takes the, requ the requirement, goes in there, the medals come off, the uniform comes off. Can't you just see it? He's about to dip in this muddy river Jordan. He'd already told Elisha, our rivers in Damascus are far superior to this. Can't you just see what is going on in his mind? When I get back to Syria, my soldiers are going to tell the people what I actually did. I got into a dirty little river because some prophet here told me I'll get rid of leprosy. So he goes, one, two, three. A New York preacher preached on this and titled Seven Ducks in a Muddy Pond. I like that title. Seven Ducks in a Muddy Pond. He goes down for the seventh time, comes up, looks down, and there is, there is no leprosy. He gets onto his animals, rides in the direction of Elisha, and he says this to him, what do I owe you for what you have done for me? Elisha was one of those rare itinerant men who said, you owe me nothing. You owe me absolutely nothing. You just go back and worship the Lord, your God. Gehazi is watching this. 
In the New Testament, we are told there was nobody ever healed of leprosy until Elisha had healed Naaman. He was witnessing a first. And what happens as Naaman goes out through the front door, Gehazi slips out through the back door, follows him, and he says this, Mr. General, sir, I come to you not for myself. I come to you for some young men who have come to study under Elisha. So this is not for me. I heard you have some gold. I heard you have some silver. I heard you have some food. I heard you have some clothing. Would you give it to me? This is not for me. This is for those young men who've come to study under Elisha. I want you to know I'm a very uh, selfless person, but very kind. This is for those ones. So Naaman says, take whatever you want. And he saddles up his donkeys, goes, Gehazi does, puts all of the stuff into his home, turns around and comes back. Elisha's waiting for him and says, where were you? Gehazi says, nowhere in particular. (laughs) I am a father of three. I know when I ask my children, where were you? And they say, nowhere in particular. It is imperative that I find out where they were in general. So Elisha says, Gehazi, now you need to remember who this Elisha is. Do you remember what Gehazi had told Elisha? That the king of Syria is astounded that you hear in your bedroom what he says in his. Gehazi did not need any more empirical evidence, but he really thought he'd wave this wand over Elisha. I was nowhere in particular. Gehazi says, you're a liar. I know where, I mean, Elisha says, Gehazi, you're a liar. I know where you were. You followed Naaman. You painted this lie. You've taken those things and put it into your room. And then that shocking of all endings, he says, the leprosy, which was Naaman's, now becomes yours. You see, Gehazi had come to a point where he lived surrounded by truth without ever applying it in his own life. He lived surrounded by truth without ever applying it in his own life. It is possible to attend missionary conferences every year when they are here and never feel a call for missions. It is possible to listen to an evangelistic sermon a thousand times over and never be evangelized in your own heart. It is possible to hear sermons on holiness and faithfulness and giving and commitment without it making any difference in our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, I shudder to think of what this world would really be like if all of us within the sound of God's word truly took it seriously. Robert W. Dale, the great preacher who had difficulty with the doctrine of hell, said there's only one man I would listen to, and that is D.L. Moody, because he said, I've never heard D.L. Moody speak on the subject, subject without breaking down in the middle of it and weeping. One of the most noted philosopher skeptics ever to stalk the historical landscape was the Scottish philosopher David Hume, who was an atheist. Any one of you who have read philosophy or read atheism recognize the name. David Hume hammered nails into the coffin of theism as possibly no other man had done before him. But one day David Hume was rushing through the streets of London, pulling his raincoat around him in the cold weather, and somebody says, Sir Hume, where are you going? He said, I'm going to listen to a man called George Whitfield preaching. And the astounded bypasser says, you don't believe what Whitfield does, do you? He says, absolutely not, but Whitfield does, and I want to hear a man who does. It's true. He says, I don't believe it, but Whitfield does, and I want to hear a man who does. Nineteen years ago, a man by the name of Oz Guinness sounded forth the warning cry at Lausanne. I wasn't at that conference, but years later I remember reading it. He's the leading Christian sociologist of our time. And Oz Guinness, warning professional evangelist, sounded the warning cry. Had it been taken seriously, the tragedy of the 80s may not have befallen us the way they did. But listen to what he said, warning professional evangelist. Why is there such constant disparagement of the mind? Why is there so much appeal to the emotions? Why so little content presupposed on which to decide? Why all the talk of souls and so little talk of whole people? Why the obvious exploitation of the testimony of the famous? Why is it so often that the more sophisticated, simplistic the message, the more sophisticated the techniques? Why the need for always being bigger and more successful? Why are you creating one-man empires with no accountability? Why the unconscious manipulations are open fraudulence in some of your appeals with people who don't know what you're talking about? A host of other questions spring to mind which we must ask ourselves. 
For example, why have so few intelligent people seriously considered Christ today? And he goes on to raise one question after another, talking about how these things had become big business. He ends with these words, part of our failure to get thinking people to take the gospel seriously is born out of a credibility gap. We claim Christianity is true, a claim which is awesome by contemporary standards, but then we whittle down our claims by the patent incongruity of our practice of the truth. The way we operate speaks louder than what we say. Without the practice of truth, evangelism is in danger of becoming a giant institutional mouth, or as E.M. Foster scornfully dismissed it, poor talkative little Christianity. You see, Guinness didn't have to say it. C.S. Lewis said it in his book so powerfully. Listen to how he words it. There have been men before now who got so interested in proving the existence of God that they came to care nothing for God himself, as if the good Lord has nothing else to do but merely exist. There have been some who have become so occupied in spreading Christianity that they've never given a thought to Christ himself. Man, you see it in smaller matters, don't you? Did you never know of a lover of books who with all of his own first editions and signed copies had lost the power to read them? Or an organizer of charities that had lost all love for the poor? It is the subtlest of all snares. Every poet and musician and artist, but for the grace of God, is drawn away from the love of the thing he tells to the love of the way he tells it, till down deep in hell he cannot be interested in God at all, but only in what he says about him, and sinks lower and lower, and becomes interested in his own personality and reputation, and nothing more. Oh, those are cutting, cutting words. And I bring you the challenge as simply as I can. How marvelous it is to know that we in this land have the privilege of hearing the Word of God. And the Word of God tells me in its teaching, as narrated by the songwriter, there's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice which is more than liberty. I think of a few weeks ago sitting in a country I'll leave unnamed where the minister of justice was in my hotel room trying to solve the drug problem in his land, unable to solve it. Murders, the greatest war-torn nation in our times where there is no undeclared war. And this big, burly individual tipped to become the president of that land sits in my hotel room and says, I have no answers for this. I don't know how to deal with the drug problem. I don't know how to deal with the crime as our judges and all are being murdered one after another. Finally, I mounted up enough courage and said to him, do you have the answer to these problems in your own life first? He says, no. And God gave me and my colleague the privilege that day in that hotel room as he bowed his head and trusted in Christ. And then the tears fall down his face and without even raising his head, he says, thank you, Lord. Thank you, doctor. And he stands up and wraps his arm around us. The man who brought him to my hotel room was in my office day before yesterday. And he says this, He said, one of the leading drug dealers and uh, uh, entrepreneurs in that traffic is in prison in, in that country. And he says, this man recently wrote to him a letter that I've seen. And in the last two lines, he said, after all of our laws have been written, after all of our police have been put to use, after all of the methods we've enjoined, I say, he said, let me tell you one thing. Outside of the salvation of Jesus Christ, I know of no, no hope for either you or myself or this nation. It is faith in Christ that's going to change us as a people. Amen. How marvelous when you can get in touch with the message. That's why the songwriter says, what language shall I borrow to thank you, dearest friend, for this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end. Oh, make me thine forever, and should I fainting be, Lord, let me never, never outlive my love for thee. My dear friend, neither Simon Wiesenthal nor I are big enough to deal with crimes as enormous as that, but somebody is, and it cost him his son, so he never trivialized it, but certainly took care of it. Out of touch with our surroundings, out of touch with our message, 
And lastly, and quite plainly, the only thing Jonah was in touch with was his own comfort. Now, does that strike a chord with you? It does with me. Because, you know, I, we get scores of invitations to our desk, and suddenly you'll see in a strange sense of humor that God has, we get this invitation that wants us to come to Orlando with our families. And halfway through the meetings, they will send us to Disney World to make it a really meaningful week. Bring the family. And at the same time, you get some invitation from somewhere that you know they haven't got the faintest clue about where they're going to put you when you arrive. They don't even know whether there will be a door to the room where they will park you for three to four days. And I've been in that just something like that two weeks ago. And you walk outside and you say, why me, Lord? I think I've paid my dues over 20 years on the road. But let's face it. Here you've got this Orlando invitation. Here you've got this other unnamed invitation. Where do you think the Spirit of the Lord will lead you to go? (laughs) Because that's how the responses are expected. God has led me to take this week up, especially because of the midweek. You've got some great plans for my family as we get there. I've I've, I've humored it up a bit, but the fact of the matter is the decisions remain just as tough, don't they? We move naturally in the direction of our comfort. We move naturally in the direction of our comfort, and yet God sometimes tells us to get out of our comfort and move into arenas of discomfort. And as I see that, I look at the whole struggle of this task of missions with a world that is in agony, world that is coming apart, and the wideness of God's mercy that wants you and me to take this message. Let me try and tie all of this together with the most potent story that comes to us out of the historical pages of the world missionary movement. I've told you Jonah was out of touch with his surroundings, that he was out of touch with his message, and the only thing he was in touch with was his own comfort. Let me now set in contrast a man who was exactly the opposite. I take you into the heart of David Livingston a man who made an incredible impact on my own life by just reading his biography many times. David Livingstone was born in Blantyre, Scotland in 1813. He sat on his father's knee, who told him stories of the famed Dutch-German missionary Carl Gutzlaff. And Livingstone at an early age made a commitment and said, Lord, send me where you want me to go. Make me that kind of a missionary. When he was only nine years old, David Livingstone had memorized the entire 119th Psalm, all 176 verses of it, to recognize the primacy of God's word in his own heart. He was a student of Latin before he began his teens, a student of the scripture, and tried to just make it like a fire within his bones. As a young man, he stood outside a cluster of African villages where he saw the smoke spiraling upwards. And in his journal, he enters these words. He says, the haunting specter of the smoke of a thousand villages has burned itself within my heart. And then he got on his knees and he wrote these words, send me anywhere, only go with me. Lay any burden on me, only sustain me. Sever any ties, but the ties that bind me to your service and to your heart. He said, through it it all, the words of Christ came to me. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. He married Mary Moffat of the famed Moffat missionary family. And the poor woman was to suffer want and deprivation for many years because of the torrid conditions under which David and she were living. They lost some of their children. She completely lost her health and finally said, David, I need to go back to recuperate my strength or I won't live much longer. He understood. He loved her dearly, and they bid each other goodbye. She came back to her homeland, and as they tried to exchange letters, which would take months to cross, she was going to set eyes upon her husband again, not after one month, not after two months, not after one year, not after two years, but five years had gone by when David Livingston set foot on home territory again. He wrapped his arms around his wife, and then she put him away for just a moment to take a good look at him. She couldn't recognize him. His face had been burned to a crisp and leather-like appearance under the sun for which his body was not prepared. 
She looked at one of his eyes when he, as he had walked into the branch of a tree and blinded him in one eye. She lost all his shoulder, which had been torn apart by a lion, and he walked with an awkward gait, and her own eyes welled up with tears. But members of the royal family wanted to meet him. Professors wanted to meet him. Medical people wanted to meet him because he was such a pioneer, breaking new ground. Finally, he looked at his wife Mary and said, Sweetheart, the haunting specter of the smoke of a thousand villages in the morning sun is still burning within my heart. She said, David, I think you should go and you should minister there. Please give me a little longer till I get well and I will join you. And they understood and accepted it. And he went. A long while later, she joined him. The very day she set foot on that soil, she contracted that disease again. A short span after that, he was going to be burying her. And an eyewitness said, as he lowered her body into the ground, they saw him kneel and mutter these words, My Jesus, my King, my life, my all. I again consecrate my life to thee. I shall place no value in anything I possess or in anything I do, except in relation to thy kingdom and to thy service. He said, The words of Christ came to me. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. He went back to his hometown of Ujiji, found out somebody had played a cruel joke and stolen his medication as his own body was racked in pain. He got on his knees in one of those rare moments for self-preservation, said, You promised you'd be with me to the end of the age, my Lord. I need that medicine. And as he prayed, he heard footsteps closing in upon him. And as he looked at those feet and followed the countenance, for the first time he was looking into the face of a white man, a stranger. He said, who are you, sir? He said, my name is Henry M. Stanley. He said, Mr. Livingston, let me tell you, Mr. Livingston, I presume, he said, those famous words. He said, are you Miss Livingston? He said, yes. He said, let me tell you two things about me. Number one, I'm the biggest swaggering atheist on the face of the earth. Please don't try to convert me. Newspapers in America have sent me to try and do a story on your life. Number two, he said, somebody has sent some medication for you. Livingston says, give me the medication, please. Four months later, the biggest swaggering atheist on the face of the earth bent his knee on African soil and gave his life to Christ. The best biography you will read of Livingston is written by Henry M. Stanley, two volumes called Livingston of Africa. I sat in David Livingston's home in Blantyre and followed the story by pictures and that enormous painting of Stanley bidding him goodbye, pleading with him to come back because he was too sick to carry on, but Livingston content to be with the people he so dearly loved. He remained on. Shortly thereafter, his closest African friend by the name of Chuma along with one of his friends, used to carry him by stretcher from village to village. One day he turned to Chuma, his beloved friend, and said, take me back home. I am too weary. I am too sick. They brought him into his home and were about to spill him onto his cot when he said, no, please help me onto my knees. And he got down on his knees and started to pray. They left him alone. His prayers were so intense, so meaningful, so personal. They stood outside, looked in a little while later, and a little later, and a little later, he was still on his knees. Juma said he needs to sleep more than he needs to continue praying. They walked in, and Chuma took him by the shoulder and said, Buana, Buana, Livingston fell over. He was dead. He died exactly the way he tried to live, in touch with his surroundings, in touch with his message, out of touch with his own comfort. Chuma carried Livingston's body 1,500 miles by foot for nine months to send him back to England, but not before he took his heart out of Livingston's body and buried it under a tree in Africa because that's where his heart really was. I don't know where you're at, friend. I know where I'm at. A long way from Livingston's quality, but you can make a first step. Are you willing this morning to pray a prayer as meaningfully as you've ever prayed to believe that the problem out there is not moral, it's spiritual? To believe that if you got in touch with the heart of God, there's a wideness in his mercy that can change the most resistant? And to believe that if you're willing to give up some of your own comforts, God is willing to use you in some of the toughest spots of the world. Can I tell you something and then I'll be through? Two weeks ago, a man came to me 
in the city of Amman in Jordan, where I just finished preaching. He wrapped his arms around me and wouldn't let go. In the Middle East, they really hug you. <laughs> when I finally asked for breathing room, you know what he said? Please hear me. My colleague was standing with me there. He said, I am, I don't know what I was preaching on that. I wasn't preaching on this. He said, I am from Nineveh. Where exists the oldest evangelical church? Would you come and preach in Nineveh for us? <laughs> and as I backed off, he said, you can be the next Jonah. <laughs> I said, no, I don't want to be the next Jonah, but I have no doubt if we come. I said, God will give us a whale of a time. So we'll consider it and get in there. Today, if you go to Nineveh, they commemorate the visit of Jonah nearly 3,000 years ago. God used him, and he said, you're concerned about a plant. I'm concerned about a people who don't know the difference between the right hand and their left. Should I not be concerned about them? Will you bow your heads with me in prayer, please? As your heads are bowed, I'd like to repeat for you a hymn by Charles Wesley that I have taken into my own heart. I want you to listen to it and see if that would echo a commitment from you today. Wesley says this, O thou who camest from above, the pure celestial fire to impart, kindle a flame of sacred love on the mean altar of my heart. There let it for thy glory burn with inextinguishable blaze, and trembling to its source return in humble prayer and fervent praise. Jesus, confirm my heart's desire to work and speak and think for thee. Still let me guard the holy fire and still stir up thy gift in me. Ready for all thy perfect will, my acts of faith and love repeat. Death thy endless mercy seal and make my sacrifice complete. Would you pray that today? With a simple one-liner, send me anywhere, only go with me. My dear friend, God can make a difference in you and make a difference in the world if you will honestly get in touch with his message and out of touch with your own comfort. I pray that many of you this morning will say, Here am I, Lord. Send me. May God bless you.